The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? One thing I ask from the Lord that I shall seek, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate on his temple. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice and be gracious to me and answer me. When thou dost say, seek my face, my heart said to thee, thy face, O Lord, I shall seek. Do not hide thy face from me. Do not turn away thy servant in your anger. Thou hast been my help. Do not abandon me or forsake me, O God of my salvation. I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Father, we come this morning into your holy presence to express our worship for you are worthy of all of our praise. Thank you for the mercy that you've shown us in staying your wrath. Thank you for the grace you've given us in showering us with blessing. Thank you for the demonstration of love, your deep personal care through the substitution of your son. We come in his name, our great high priest, thanking you that we can come and find grace in time of need. You said that we are to comm- you commanded us to cast all of our burdens upon you knowing that you care for us. Thank you that you are who you are. As we open your word this morning, we come with a deep sense of need and helplessness because we want to understand what you have inspired here by the Apostle John and by the Spirit of God. And so be our teacher, Holy Spirit. Illumine the truth that you put in front of us. Allow us to gird up our minds for action, to put away any distracting thoughts. We thank you that we hold, what we hold in our laps is the very word of God itself. So we come with a deep sense of reverence. And I come, Father, seeking to rightly divide the word of truth. I just ask for your help, for your anointing. I ask it for the glory of Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen. Would you take your Bibles this morning and turn to John chapter 18? We're in that portion of the fourth gospel that records the greatest crime in all of human history, the murder of the Son of God by the sons of men. Jesus Christ, who years before was declared by the forerunner John the Baptist as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, is about to become that Passover Lamb. And as you move through these final chapters, you discover that they unfold really in three major movements. It begins with Christ's condemnation, it moves into his crucifixion, but then he concludes with his glorious conquest over death. Now we want to begin reading this morning where we left off last time. I hope you bring a Bible to church. I know a lot of you have been in churches where you don't really need a Bible, but if you're going to grow in Christ, you need to learn the Word of God, and if you need a Bible, tell me, I'll help you to find one that you can understand and read. John 18, beginning now in verse 28. Then they led Jesus, therefore, from Caiaphas into the praetorium. And it was early, and they themselves did not enter into the praetorium, in order that they might not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. Therefore Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Pilate therefore said to him, take him yourselves and judge him according to the law, your law. The Jews said to him, we're not permitted to put anyone to death. The word of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what kind of death he was about to die. Therefore, Pilate entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, are you saying this on your own initiative or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest delivered you up to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore, Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. 
For this I have been born and for this I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears the truth. Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him. I know many of you are walking into this passage for the very first time. So let me bring you up to speed as to where we are in these events leading up to the crucifixion. When you come to the 18th chapter, you discover that the plan that these Jewish leaders had been working on for some time now comes to a climax. It's late at night. Jesus had prayed his prayer where he sweat blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, away from the city buildings, away from onlooking eyes, away from the multitudes who may have tried to rescue him had he been arrested in the city. And then suddenly in the darkness of a night, A small army comes in with their clubs and their swords, their torches and their lanterns. They hear the clanking of men and of arms. And that dark garden is suddenly filled with light as they bring their lanterns and torches into it. And they see 12 men there in the garden. But our Lord does not run. He comes out to meet them. Judas, at this point, who had already betrayed him with a kiss had identified him as the one they came to arrest. And then Jesus, not as some fearful peasant rabbi, steps up and with his commanding presence, he asks the question, whom do you seek? They said, Jesus, the Nazarene. And then if you remember, he responded, I am. Literally, I am. He is in italics in your text because it's not a part of the original. It was added there by the translator, so it wouldn't be so wooden when you translate it into English. But in this case, it's a little distracting to the point that Jesus wants to make. Whom do you seek? Jesus the Nazarene. Ego ami. Yahweh, the Hebrew would be. I am. And he uses the covenant name of God by which God identified himself to Moses. And when he had said, I am, the Bible says they drew back and fell to the ground. By using the divine name because it was true of his person, power emanated from himself and they all fell backwards. Had Caesar commanded all of the armies of the world, the response would have been the same. The whole pile went back as they came for this unarmed, lonely figure. The power of his name put them on the ground, but he didn't leave them there. He could have and he could have walked away. But he didn't because he wanted to demonstrate a truth that he had come to give his life and that no one was going to take it from him. The legions of angels in heaven, Matthew tells us, were the battlements of heaven staring over, just waiting for the command. Lord Jesus, destroy them all. That's all they had to all he had to say. But the command never came. Understand, he was not simply arrested. He allowed those men on that day to take him away. And what happens is the most fallacious, unfair, disorderly and illegal series of trials that ever took place in the history of jurisprudence. Never before has there been anyone so innocent and never before has anyone ever been treated so unfairly. Now, contrary to popular opinion, there was not one trial But six trials, they came really in two phases. The first phase, there was three Jewish trials. The second phase, there were three Roman trials. Now, under God's sovereign plan, Jesus had to stand before Rome. If you were here last time, we looked in verses 12 through 27, where we saw the first two trials before Annas, the high priest, and then before Caiaphas, the high priest. Look at verse 13. And they, that is, led him to Annas first, and he, for he was father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. So he goes to Annas first. And John alone notes this particular trial that our Lord faces. And if you don't read these verses carefully, as I noted last time, it's easy to become confused because this man is called the high priest. And then you drop down a few verses and Caiaphas is referred to as the high priest. So who's the high priest? Well, they both are. If you remember from 86 to 8015, Pontius Pilate's predecessor had appointed Annas to be the high priest. But then he disposed of him because he was apparently becoming too powerful, though his power somehow continued to be retained because the next five who serve as high priests are his sons and then his grandson. 
And then three years after Anna steps down, after these six serve, his son-in-law, Josephus um, Caiaphas, steps into the throne. And so on this night, there are two high priests because under Jewish law, under the Mosaic law, when you were appointed high priest, you were a high priest for life. And so in the Jews' mind, Annas is really the high priest. But they also recognize that Caiaphas is the only one that Rome recognizes at this point. And interwoven between these trials of Annas and Caiaphas are the three denials of the Apostle Peter. Look at verse 19. The high priest, that is honest, therefore questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teachings. The first question concerned his man, the second what he taught. The Lord ignores the first question because he doesn't want to draw attention to his man but to himself, and he wants to show the illegality of their trial. Notice his response. It's emphatic all the way through in the Greek text. The pronoun I, you could say it was underlined in the original. We might translate it. Jesus answered him. I, even I, spoke openly to the world. I, even I, always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. And I, even I, spoke nothing in secret. Why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I, even I, spoke to them. Behold, these know what I, even I, said. He draws the attention from his men because he's going to love them to the end. And he puts it on himself. He answers their question to the point. His teaching had been in the open. The multitudes had heard him in their synagogues and their fields and their valleys and even at their own temple precincts. He had not hidden anything. All of his teaching was public property. So if they wanted to know what he taught, just ask the multitudes. But this answer would have rubbed them raw because under Jewish law, under the Mosaic law and under the codified oral traditions of that day, God had dictated that at the testimony of two or three witnesses, a man must be accused that it was not the responsibility of Jesus to defend his innocence, but it was the responsibility of Jesus' accusers to come and to present claims against him. And so the way this trial is even being handled by interviewing Jesus without bringing any witnesses is an illegitimate trial. Now, what he says, it rubs them wrong. It bothers them because he's calling them on the mat. He is showing them what they are doing is illegal. Look at their response. And when he had said this, one of the officers standing by gave Jesus a blow. The new, new American standard said they struck him. It's a Greek word where someone would take the flat of their hand and put it across a person's face. And he says, is that the way you answer the high priest? This temple police officer slapped the face of his maker. He slapped the face of almighty God. Jesus answered him. Notice, if I have spoken wrongly, bear witness of the wrong. But if rightly, why do you strike me? He doesn't back down. If what he said was inaccurate or inappropriate, then you ought to file a contempt of court charge. But they don't do that. He says he challenges them. Bear witness. Testify of the wrong that I've done. If I was wrong, prove me wrong. But if I spoke the truth, then why do you slap me? Why is why are we having this unfair trial? And so he's unmasking their hypocrisy. Now, Honest's whole purpose is to gather some information about his teaching or about his disciples that he might ultimately bring to Caiaphas and then to Rome. And so unable to really accomplish anything, he sends them off to Caiaphas. Notice verse 24. Honest therefore sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now, he recognizes that if there is going to be a formal legal accusation, it must come from the one that Rome recognizes. John doesn't really comment on the trial of Caiaphas. You can read about it. In Matthew 26 or Mark 14. But in either case, it took place during the night. Uh, Matthew 26, 57 tells us that Caiaphas got together some scribes and some elders. And they tried to bring evidence against the Lord Jesus. But everyone who testified gave conflicting reports. Finally, they got two witnesses who both said that he had set out to destroy the temple. But as Matthew notes in Matthew twenty six sixty three, even their testimony was not consistent. 
So Caiaphas steps up to the place plate and he puts Jesus under oath and he says, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us whether you are the Messiah, the son of God, to which any pious Jew when put under oath would have to respond. And Jesus said, you have said it yourself. And so Caiaphas tore his robe for he found him guilty of blasphemy. I like the first trial before Annas. It happened in the dark of night. It was a mockery of sorts. They wanted to try Jesus, find him guilty and have him in Roman hands ever before the people woke up. Now, you asked, did he have to go far to go to Caiaphas and see him? No, it's in the same compound. How do you know? Because when you read the synoptic gospels, it is clear that the three denials of Peter that take place take place right outside of Jesus going into honest and then Jesus coming out from Caiaphas. And so he's at the same fire when he denies Jesus. Either honest had a separate room in his house in which the council, the Jewish Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin would have met and Caiaphas met with them in there or very possibly because families lived in compounds. Caiaphas's house was right next to his father-in-law's. In either case, that brings us into our text this morning. If you're using your outline, you can see we've divided into two major portions. In verses 28 to 32, we find the accusation. And then in verses 33 to 38, the examination. So let's begin with the accusation. Verse 28. Then they, that is the Jewish priests and uh, scribes along with the temple priests, they led Jesus, therefore, from Caiaphas into the praetorium. Now, there are two dimensions of this accusation that I don't want you to miss this morning. First, I want to highlight in your thinking the spiritual bondage of these chief priests. He's led, the Bible says, from Caiaphas into the praetorium. Now, John doesn't take the time to tell us of a third trial that took place. Luke does, because Caiaphas, though he found him guilty, if it's going to be, quote unquote, legal, he has to try him in the daylight hours. He has to try him when the sun is up. Now, where uh, Jerusalem is on this particular latitude, I was in Jerusalem once and I woke up at 4.15 in the morning and the sun was coming up over the horizon. And it was early in the morning, and so they gathered the Sanhedrin together, which was a body of 70 men, and only the corporate Sanhedrin could ultimately come down with a guilty verdict for one, for one who is guilty of a capital punishment charge. Let me read to you what Luke records. And when it was day, the council, that is the Sanhedrin, the council of elders of the people assembled, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to their council chambers, saying, if you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask a question, you will not answer. But from now on, the son of man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. And so now the question that was asked by Caiaphas is asked by the whole Sanhedrin. And they said to him, are you the son of God then? And he said, yes, I am. And they said, what further need do we have of testimony? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. Now, John admits this particular trial because it's inconsequential to the Romans. They could care less about the Supreme Court, what the Sanhedrin thought. The only one that mattered was the high priest that they put into office. In addition By the time John writes this gospel, the last gospel to be written, Jerusalem had been destroyed. The people had been scattered by Rome. And really, all that really mattered at this time was Roman power. Now, look again in verse 28 of our text. Then they led Jesus, therefore, from Caiaphas into the praetorium. And it was early. If you're using the King James, it doesn't say the praetorium. It says the judgment hall. And that's a translation of the Greek word. Praetorium. That's what the word praetorium means, a judgment hall. And so in taking him into the praetorium, we know that the three Jewish trials are over and the Roman trials have begun. Now, Pilate normally lived in Caesarea in in a palace that Herod the Great had built. However, Pilate, like his predecessors and his successors, made it their point That whenever there was a high holy festival in Jerusalem, that they would come on location and he would make as his residence the fortress of Antonia. 
This fortress had been built by Herod the Great, named after his own friend, Mark Antony. And he would come and be on location because they were always fearful when Jews came from all over Israel, from all over the outside Greek uh, Roman Empire, that they would come and potentially, because tens of thousands of pilgrims would come, there could be some fierce Jewish nationalism. And so the forces were beefed up and the governor himself would be there on location. Now, the Bible says they led Jesus from Caiaphas into the Praetorium and it was early. We're going to see next time that it's somewhere between 5 a.m. and 6 a.m. And that's not unusual. According to Josephus, the, the Roman government would begin to conduct business as soon as the sun came up and they would be tried to finish with all of their court cases by 11 o'clock. Now, they had already officially, by the high priest Caiaphas, condemned Jesus to death. And they expect the Romans, of course, to ratify it. And when they arrived, John tells us, and they themselves did not enter into the praetorium in order that they might not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. John gives this note about their concern over being defiled. Now, at this time in Jewish history, there was... Uh, a lot of oral tradition that had come down. Some of it was based on scripture. Some of it was not. Under the Old Testament law, you could be ceremonially defiled in a number of different ways. And, and God highlighted some of the ceremonial law to show man how sinful he was and to remind man habitually of his need for a savior. Now, according to Leviticus 15, there was some defilement that a Jew could experience where if at the end of the day he just took a bath, he would be okay. But there was some kind of defilement here that in their minds went beyond just taking a bath at the end of the day because they were fearful that if they went into the praetorium, into a Gentile residence, that they would be defiled in such a way that they wouldn't be able to eat Passover at all. Now, the kind of defilement that would bring that, according to Numbers 15, was contact, or Numbers 9, was contact with a dead body. And the Mishnah, the Mishnah is part of a book called the Talmud. The Talmud had two parts to it. The Mishnah, which was a record of the oral tradition, and then a commentary that followed. The Mishnah that was written about 200 A.D. that reflected the beliefs of Jesus' day by the Jews taught that Gentile homes were unclean. And the reason they taught they were unclean is because it was the practice of Gentiles to take their miscarried or aborted fetuses and to bury them in their own homes. And so a Jew would never walk into a Gentile home because he considered it unclean. Now, remember, it's Friday morning. It's Good Friday, as we call it today. Good because what is going to be accomplished is good for you and for me. It's Passover, as it were, and they're fearful that if they go into this Gentile residence that they will be defiled, and then they wouldn't be able to celebrate Passover for an entire month. Think about it. Here are these guys. They're all caught up about ceremonial defilement. They're all caught up with all these rituals, and yet they are willing to condemn an innocent man. You can see their spiritual blindness. You can see their spiritual bondage. And it's really not all that different today. There are a lot of people, religious people, who will come with their rules of one sort or another that they will make for themselves, and yet they will blow off the moral dictates of God. Oh, they'll fast on a holy day of obligation, but they'll get drunk the next day. Some people last night, maybe it was you, you were in some central discotheque, these new dances that people dance. It's like having sex with your clothes on. They'll be there on Saturday night. They'll be drunk, but they'll be here on Sunday morning. They'll bring their tithe. They'll make sure that they honor the Lord's day. They'll make sure that they come to Sunday school. They'll make sure they'll have their Bible in hand. And they cover over with religious activity their own guilt because they do not want to face their sin. So here are some guys who are scrupulous about contracting some kind of defilement so they can eat the Passover, but they have no problem putting an innocent man to death. They partake in a judicial murder. That's their spiritual bondage. 
consider also with me their spiritual slander, their spiritual slander of the priests. Again, in verse 29, therefore, Pilate went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? Now, Pontius Pilate, or you could pronounce it Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea is now introduced to us. He was appointed by Emperor Tiberius in 26 A.D. and served until 36 A.D. And the historians of the day who wrote about him, and we have their records, pictured him as a morally weak, vacillating man who would very often cover over his weakness with gross brutality. And as we will see next week, as John will paint him, he is a morally weak person. And at times he was very brutal. Luke tells us in Luke, the 13th chapter, on one occasion, he slaughtered a bunch of innocent Gentiles and then he took their blood and he mingled it with the Jewish sacrifices. I mean, that was an abomination to the Jew. And so they absolutely hated and despised this man. And as we read John's account, we're going to see Pilate habitually looking for some kind of loophole because he has to satisfy his conscience, a man whom he knows is innocent. And at the same time, he wants to deal with these Jewish leaders. And so you read as he uh, as we walk through this trial in the days ahead, a man who becomes increasingly afraid. John will later say in the 19th chapter, he gets more afraid, implying he was afraid already. He had heard about Jesus. He's spooked by Jesus. He's scared about Jesus. And he's also scared about Emperor Tiberius because he knows if he blows it with him, he can lose his job and ultimately his head. In either case, Pilate, it says in verse 29, went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? Now, the text says he went out to them. A Roman governor would have been aware of certain Jewish practices and what deeply religious people they were. And they would very often honor those practices, especially on a feast day, in order to keep the peace. Because if you didn't maintain peace, you were in big trouble. He already almost lost his job when he first came into Judea. Because when he came in, he had all these shields and painted on the outside of the shields, Pliny tells us, was a Roman pagan god, and he hung them up in the city, and their soldiers wore them, and the Jews were deeply offended. They saw it as a symbol of idolatry, and they asked Pilate to get rid of the shields or to paint over them, but he would not. And so as they're right as a subjugated people, they appealed to Caesar Tiberius, and Tiberius said, you get rid of those pagan idols on the shield, or we're going to get rid of you. Tiberius was going to make peace even with the Jews. So what accusation? The proceedings begin. What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, if this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Now, that is a very interesting statement that they make. They knew that they didn't have any real specific charge against him that would stand up in a Roman court of law. And so unable to come up with a specific accusation, they just make an allegation that attacks his character. He's an evildoer. And I think they assumed that Pilate would cooperate because Rome had cooperated in the arrest. And I think they assumed that Pilate would just rubber stamp the trial that would follow. If he were not an evildoer, we would have not delivered him up to you. See what they're saying? Do you think, Pilate, we would bring somebody to you who is not a bad, horrible person? Don't test our character. Don't impugn our motives. And it really what they say reeks with a sense of sarcasm. It implies that Pilate ought to be able to trust them because they wouldn't hand over anyone but a criminal. And the Greek text, the word for evil doer, actually two words, kakon poion, literally means someone whose character is inherently evil. Someone who's continually engaged in evil by the tense that he uses. Listen, even unbelievers today will not typically impugn Christ's character in that way. People today who will not say he is God in a body, as he claimed, will at least say, oh, he's a good man. He's a great prophet. He was a wonderful teacher. I mean, after all, he's done more good for humanity than all that, uh, you know, all the other religious teachers of this world put together. You think Muhammad's done good for humanity? Have you ever read the Quran? You know, we got some people today who take it very, very seriously. 
They are just fundamentalists in the sense that they literally believe what the Quran says. Now, over here, most Muslims have been westernized. But do you think the Muslims have built hospitals? Do you think other religious leaders have has their teachings has resulted in tens of thousands and millions of orphans being taken care of in 20 centuries? No, Jesus has done more good in terms of hospitals, feeding the poor, teaching people to forgive and to love one another. Even pagans will acknowledge that. When Peter summarizes the life of the Lord Jesus to Cornelius in Acts 10, he says, he went about doing good. I mean, after all, he healed the sick. He gave sight to the blind. He unstopped deaf ears. He fed the hungry. He raised the dead. He taught them so much about how to get along with one another. And so they could not find a single flaw in the Son of Man. And so they come up with this scandalous attack against his character. He's an evildoer. Pilate knows it's slander. Look at verse 31. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. He knew what they wanted. But if they were to talk in vague generalities then he was not about to try him. This man does have, as we'll see, some sense of justice. Take him in your own court system. If you want me to execute him, you better come up with something of substance. Take him yourselves. Judge him according to your law. Now, the Romans respected the laws and customs, not all of them, but many of the laws and customs of subjugated people. You can read an example in Acts 18 where... Gallio, the proconsul, doesn't want to deal with a case. He says, you guys judge it according to your law. But when Pilate referred the case back to them, it irked them. Notice their response. The Jews said to him, we're not permitted to put anyone to death. What are they doing? They're citing Roman law and they would cite it when it served their own evil purposes. What do they want? They want an execution. They want blood. They want a crucifixion. They want Jesus Christ dead. The only problem is they had lost their ability to administer capital punishment. Now, remember the Talmud that was written about 200 A.D. It makes this statement. And let me quote directly from it. The Talmud says, 40 years before the destruction of the temple, judgment in matters of death was taken away from our people, the people of Israel. Now, when was the temple destroyed? 70 A.D. Titus Vespucius came in just as Jesus predicted. He said not a single stone would stand upon another. That temple was covered over in gold. They burned it. The gold melted and the Romans and others literally pried apart apart the rocks to get the gold out. It was fulfilled just like Jesus said. So if the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. and the Talmud and historians don't doubt the correctness of this. Forty years before the destruction of the temple, their ability to exercise capital punishment was taken away. What year does that take us to? 30 A.D. What year did Jesus die? 30 A.D. God sovereignly was working in the affairs of men and nations. Though it was a Jewish plot, it was a Gentile execution. And in God's mind, it is a fulfillment of prophecy. What does Proverbs 21.1 say? The king's heart is like channels of water in the hands of the Lord. He turns it in whatever direction he wishes. God turned the heart of Emperor Tiberius. And in this very year, he took away their ability to execute capital punishment. And why is that significant? Well, the Jews say, we're not permitted to put anyone to death. Look at verse 32. That the word of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spoke, signifying by what kind of death he was about to die. Now, when did Jesus give this prophecy about the kind of death he was going to die? You might want to put next to verse 32, chapter 12, verse 32, John 12, 32, 33. Let me read it to you. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. And then John reminds us in the next verse. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. That's very significant because John says 
that this all happened in verse 32 of our chapter this morning, that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled. What is he doing? He has given us that kind of phrase before, that the word of God might be fulfilled. And then he quotes an Old Testament prophet when that word is fulfilled. But in this particular occasion, he puts the word that is being fulfilled in the mouth of the Lord Jesus because he's putting the Old Testament scriptures on the same par as the very things that Jesus said. And so should we. If Jesus Christ is God in a body, as he claimed then every single word that ever came out of his mouth is absolute truth. So you have to decide what you're going to do with the Lord Jesus. If he is God in a body, then his words are absolutely true. God in his sovereignty is working through human history in order to bring a fulfillment about what Jesus said And also what the prophets said. Now, Jesus had just said it again a couple days before. Let me read it to you from Matthew's account. He said, you know that after two days, the Passover is coming and the son of man is to be delivered up by crucifixion. You say, why is that significant? Because the Old Testament taught that Messiah, the Christ, would die by crucifixion. 700 years before Isaiah, the prophet said he would be pierced through for our transgressions. A thousand years before Psalm 22 stated he would be his hands and his feet would be pierced. Zechariah 12 and verse 10, 400 years before said that they will look on me whom they have pierced. God had determined that Messiah would be pierced through, that he would be crucified. And again, that is significant because had the Jews been in control, had the Jews had the power of execution, how would they have killed him? Stoning him to death. But that's not how God wanted him killed. God wanted him to hang on a tree to become a curse because the Old Testament says, cursed is every man who hangs on a tree. And by the way, Paul uses that as an argument to the Galatians who had let these false teachers come in who had basically soured and polluted the gospel by adding works as a basis by which you could be saved. Let me read it to you. Galatians 3, verse 10, Paul writes, For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Curse is everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law to perform them. Paul says, listen, if you want to be saved by the works of the law, and interestingly, the false teachers, they're called Judaizers, who had come into Galatia, What they had basically said was this. They didn't deny the death, burial and resurrection of Christ, but they said it wasn't enough. They said, in addition to what Jesus did, if you're going to be saved, you need to be circumcised. They added just one single work to the finished work of Christ. And Paul says, if you do that, you are preaching another gospel, a false gospel, and you come under the anathema of God. People get mad at me. I tell them, look, these denominations, the Christian church, the church of Christ and others who say that baptism saves or helps saves, they're preaching a different gospel. They are doing the same thing that those were doing in Galatia. They were distorting the gospel. And Paul says, listen, if you add anything to what Jesus did on that cross, then his death was in vain. It was for absolutely nothing. But Paul said to the Galatians, why do you get mad at me for telling you the truth? Sometimes I ask, why are you mad at me for telling you what the scriptures plainly say? Don't take it up with me. Take it up with God. Because if you want to be justified by even a single act of obedience, then you had better complete the whole law. Because James 2.10 says, if you're guilty in one point of the law, you're guilty of the entire law. So Paul argues in Galatians 3.11, no one is justified. No one is saved by the law before God. That's evident. How do we know? He quotes their Old Testament. The righteous man shall live by faith. He's quoting Habakkuk 2.4. The just shall live by his faith. No one can live eternally unless they come by faith in the Lord Jesus and his finished work on our behalf. The law was never given to save you. It was given to reveal to you how heinous and horrible you and I are and how great our need is for a savior. And so he will say Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who hangs on a tree. God was going to allow the Lord Jesus Christ to become a curse. 
He was going to hang him on a tree at a cross. And what the Jews thought was utter foolishness, Paul calls the power of God unto salvation. And so that the Jews could not exercise capital punishment and that they have to come to Pilate to have him executed is incredibly significant. God is going to have his son become a curse so that when he would shed his blood, you and I could be forgiven because without the shedding of his blood, there is no forgiveness. Now, that's the accusation. That brings us now into the examination. The formal examination of the Lord revolves around five questions. And as we study these questions, you get the feeling more and more that it's not just Jesus who's on trial, but Pilate. In fact, by the time he is done in the 19th chapter, he's totally frightened of Jesus. Now look at verse 33. Therefore, Pilate entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus. Now, it's very doubtful that Pilate knew Aramaic, and there's no mention at all of an interpreter. There's just a free flow of dialogue between the Lord Jesus and Pilate. I happen to believe that Jesus knew not simply Aramaic, but Greek as well. And that shouldn't surprise you. You know, you go to Europe today, and all these nations are in close proximity, and it's hard to find a European who doesn't know two or three languages. You know what they call someone who knows three languages, right? Trilingual. Someone who knows two languages, bilingual. Someone who knows one language, an American. Right. All right. Here's the point. Jesus, I think like Paul, knew more than one language. Paul could read the scriptures. He read the Hebrew scriptures. He spoke Aramaic. And on two different accounts, he confronted the people in their own tongue of Greek. So in either case, Jesus comes into the praetorium away from the Jewish eyes, away from the gathering crowd that is beginning to build. And he stands before Pilate. And the very first question is what I am calling the salient question of Pilate. It's the most important question Pilate will ask. Notice, he asks, are you the king of the Jews? Now, by now, the Lord's malicious enemies had brought up that charge that no Roman governor could ignore. Not if you didn't fear the emperor. Jesus claimed to be the Messiah of Israel, the son of God, who would sit on David's throne. What did the prophet say? What did God say himself to King David? Listen to these words from 2 Samuel 7. He says to David, when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, that is when you die, I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you, that is from your lineage, and I will establish his kingdom forever. God says, David, someday you're going to die. But out of your loins, out of the house of David, is going to come Messiah who is not going to die. He is going to have an eternal kingdom. So if Jesus claims that he is Christ, he is claiming to be a king. And if he is a king, since there can be no king but Caesar, unless he's some political sub-vassal like Herod. We'll look at that next time. Since there can be no king but Caesar, then they have a treasonous charge against him. And so their solution has been found. Blasphemy is not going to rub with Pilate. He won't buy that. He doesn't care about their religious charges. He only cares about some kind of violation against the Roman government. And now they've got it. And so, if he is found guilty of treason, Roman law dictated you would die the very day you are found guilty. You say, why is that significant? Because this is Passover. This is Good Friday. And those lambs who for thousands of years had pictured what the Lamb of God would do, it is about to become a reality where Christ, our Passover, will be sacrificed for us. And so these Jewish men are bringing this crime before the Roman government, but God is working behind it all. Are you, and you is emphatic, it's underlined in the middle, in the original, are you... You of all people, the king of the Jews. Now, his question contains an element of astonishment because nothing would seem to indicate that he would be a king. Oh, yeah, they were aware of the fact that days before on on Sunday, he came into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. They knew about the Hosannas, but that was a joke to the Roman government that a king would come in that fashion as we studied months ago. 
Not to mention, he didn't exhibit any of the fierce traits of a revolutionary, of some fanatical Jew who wants to overthrow Rome. And so he says, are you the king of the Jews? It's very sarcastic and incredulous. Look at his response, verse 34. Are you saying this on your own initiative or did others tell you about me? Now, in the other Gospels, Jesus initially responds by saying, it's as you say. That is to say, yes, I am king of the Jews. But then John reports that Jesus asks the question in order to shed light on the nature of his kingship. Pilate asks, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, are you saying this on your own initiative or did others tell you about me? He wants Pilate to tell him whether this was his own idea that he conjured up or whether he was coached by others. Who told you? Is this something you deduced yourself or is this something... That was brought to you by Caiaphas and his crowd. Now, if Pilate asked this of himself, the question would mean, are you a political king? That is, are you conspiring against Caesar? And the answer would be no. But if this question came from Caiaphas, then the question really is, are you the messianic king of Israel? And the answer would be yes. And Jesus wants to know whether this question comes from Pilate himself or from some other source. Not because he doesn't know the answer. He knows the answer. He is the omniscient son of God. He's not asking for information's sake. He's asking for Pilate's sake. He wants him to think about the origin of his question because obviously he poses absolutely no threat at all to the Roman government. So since it is the second, are you going to think about it? King. Of the Jews. Pilate, do you have any desire? It's an appeal. God loved even his enemies. He loved even Pilate like he loved Judas. Pilate, do you understand the deeper spiritual significance? Or are you just going to accept this charge on the surface? Are you willing to accept what in your thinking is nothing more than some vague accusation that you really don't know anything about? Or are you going to ponder that I could be king of the Jews? And so with that one question, Pilate's put on the dock. The prisoner has become the judge, which brings us to the second question, what I'm calling a scornful question, the scornful question of Pilate. Verse 35, he says, I'm not a Jew, am I? His question reflected the deep anti-Semiticism that they had for the Jewish people, for their ethnicity and their own religious ideas. He's saying, listen, whether you're, Jew, whether you're a Jewish king or not means nothing to me. I'm not here to contemplate that kind of claim. After all, he says, your own nation, the chief priest delivered you up to me. Obviously, there's something behind this, Jesus. You obviously did something that has aroused such deep hostility in these folks. Look, typically, unless their own power to rule was threatened, if somebody was going to oppose Rome, they encouraged them, they led them, because they hated Rome. But not on this occasion. And so Pilate's a little suspicious. Are they using him? What's behind all this? Which brings us to the third question, the serious question. He asks them outright, what have you done? What is it that you have done, Jesus, that has brought such hostility by your own nation? And Jesus is going to answer so that it will be entered in the court scripts for every generation of people to read from Holy Scripture. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm Jesus wants him to understand, listen, my kingdom is in no way connected to this world. It's not a kingdom the way the world defines a kingdom. If it were, then my followers would have weapons. They would not have allowed me to have been arrested. I would have had soldiers and we wouldn't be here. Now, I'm sure by this time, Pilate had already heard what had happened. That when they went to arrest Jesus, this army, conservatively 800, maybe as high as 1400, they all fell backwards, momentarily paralyzed. So he's frightened of him. My kingdom's not of this world. Oh, really? He heard about Jesus, the miracle worker. He's going to get more frightened as we come into the 18th chapter and he makes another claim about himself. But the fact that he's arrested so easily, 
He even himself put down and stifled what Peter tried to do when he took his sword. The fact that he was arrested so easily shows that his kingdom is from another realm. And by the way, please do not misconstrue the words of the Lord Jesus like the Amish have done with this text. To say that his kingdom is not active in this world or that his kingdom has nothing to do with this world. On the contrary, the church is called to engage the world, to be salt and light in the world. And that our weaponry is not man-made, but divinely powerful, able to bring down fortresses, Paul will say. But here's the point. Jesus wants Peter to know, uh, Pilate to know that his kingdom was a spiritual kingdom and not of this world. He was not some kind of militant Messiah. Which brings us to the fourth question, the sobering question of Pilate. Therefore, Pilate said to him, so you're a king, Jesus answered. You've said correctly, I am a king. And so the Lord Jesus wants Pilate to know he is indeed a king. And so he goes on and he begins to spell out the nature of his reign. Notice, for I have been born, for this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Now there's double emphasis here. You should underline it in your Bible, the words, I have been born, and the words, I have come. There is a note of pre-existence. There's an affirmation that he is son of man and son of God. As the son of man, he was born king of the Jews. Where is Jesus born king of the Jews? Herod would ask. But as the son of God, he came from another world. If he came into this world, that means he had to come from somewhere. To be born is to be human. To come into the world is to be divine. He is a divine human person. Truly God, truly man. And so he says, for this reason I came into the world. Why? To bear witness of the truth. And then he says, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. In other words, only those who are on the side of truth will embrace what I say. He came. He is the embodiment of truth. He is the truth, John said, in a recorded of Jesus saying in John 14, 6. He came and He exegeted the Father. He taught that He was the one who could uniquely save. He revealed about God's judgment, about God's Messiah, and God's truth. And everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. That is an implicit invitation to the governor. That brings us to the fifth and final question. The speculative question of Pilate. Pilate comes back to him and he says, what's truth? What's truth? A flippant question that he really doesn't want the answer to. He doesn't wait to hear what the Lord Jesus has to say, which really demonstrates he's not a part of this kingdom. Now, nowadays we have a popular notion that truth is relative. Truth is whatever you want it to be. It's situational. It's dependent on your circumstances. Oh, you can have sex with a girl before you get married as long as you don't hurt her. As long as it's consensual. You can have a relationship and commit adultery as long as both are in agreement. Oh, it's all relative. Doesn't matter. Now, God has some absolutes. Now we've moved into what they call postmodernism, which says truth can't be discovered at all. Here's Pilate standing before the one who is truth. But with a touch of cynicism, he just dismisses him and he says, what's truth? The text says, and when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him. He walks out of the praetorium, meets them again at their meeting ground, as it were. And he says, there's no basis for a charge, which, by the way, tells me he understood the question Jesus asked. Are you a king? He understood that when Jesus said yes, that it was not any kind of a political kingdom that would endanger Caesar's empire, but that he was indeed the king of Israel. And that will be very important when we come to next week's portion. Now, how does this apply to us, this narrative portion of Scripture? What are some timeless principles that we can carry away today? Well, number one, I am reminded from this text that it is very possible to be highly religious but lost and destined for hell. There are many religious people in this world who use religion as a cover-up for their own sin. Now, these Jews were so careful not to go into a Gentile home lest they be defiled. 
Here is a classic example of what Jesus said in Matthew 23, when he leveled seven woes on the leadership of the nation, where they strain out a gnat and they swallow a camel. It's a classic illustration of whitewashed tombs that on the outside look righteous, but on the inside is full of dead man's bones. It is a classic illustration of what Jesus said in Matthew 23, 28, of those who outwardly appear to be righteous, but inwardly are full of hypocrisy and unrighteousness. We got people like that here today. People who are careful to observe religious... Oh, it's Easter. You know, i got to show up. It's Easter. You know, we won't be able to fit them in here on Easter. We'll be packed out on three services. They'll come out of the woodwork. It's Easter. You know, we got to come to church. Oh, it's Sunday. You know, i got to be in church on Sunday. Now, why you wouldn't be in church on Sunday is beyond me. And why some of you dads sleep in and don't bring your kids to church on the Lord's Day, and you teach them by example that you can blow off one of the Ten Commandments is beyond me. Listen, when they grow up to be teenagers and rebel, don't blame anybody else but yourself. But friend, you can cover your life up in religion. You could have been out in the bar last night and put your tithe in the plate today. There are people who do it every single week. And if we know who they are, we put them under church discipline because we love them. And we don't want the name of this church, the body of Christ, to be mocked. But may I remind you that all of your religion can never save you. Isaiah, to a group of people who thought the same way, he says your righteous deeds are as a filthy garment. Not your bad deeds, not your evil deeds, but your good deeds, your most righteous deeds before an infinitely holy God is like a dirty rag. They can never save you. And so when Jesus exposed Phariseeism in Matthew 23, he tells us that the majority of those people end up in hell. You can be very religious, but lost and headed for hell. Secondly, I am also reminded from this text of Scripture that if you have ears to hear the truth, you will embrace Christ as your king, not just as your savior. But as your king, Jesus plainly tells Pilate here, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. You can't claim to be of the truth. You cannot claim to be a saved person if you do not hear Christ's truth. What does it mean to hear? The Greek word means to hear with understanding and to obey. Now understand, you are not saved by obeying, you are not saved by hearing. But friend, if you are saved, you will hear, you will obey. What did Jesus say in Matthew 10? My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. You don't earn eternal life. It is the gift of God given to those who will yield to Christ as Lord. But friend, if you're one of those sheep to whom this gift has been given, the Bible says you'll hear his voice and you will follow him. You claim to know the embodiment of truth and you don't follow him. Met a guy this week. I said, who's this lady? Well, you know, my wife and I, we divorced last month. She's my new girlfriend. Oh, really? Just break the marriage covenant, blow it off, find another woman and shack up with her. I'm telling you, friend, we are living in challenging days. When we come to the 19th chapter, shall I crucify your king? Pilate will say, and they will say, we have no king but Caesar. That was sheer hypocrisy. They hated Caesar. On the other hand, it was true because they had no king. God was not their king and they want to murder the king of kings. Do you remember what our Lord said in the Sermon on the Mount? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. In the parallel text, he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord? Why do you ascribe that title to me and you don't do what I say? Jesus thought that if your profession does not match your lifestyle, it is an empty profession. Yes, a verbal public profession of faith is what every true Christian will give. Jesus said, everyone, therefore, who shall confess me before men, I will also confess him before my father who's in heaven. That's why we have an invitation each week to give people an opportunity to do that. 
But understand, there are scores of people down through the ages who have made their public profession of faith and it was empty. You're not saved by walking this aisle. You're not saved by any works. But if it's real, you will go public. But if it's real, you will also hear and heed the Word of God. He will say, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in Your name? And in Your name cast out demons? And in Your name perform many miracles? Please underscore that word, many. Our Lord is not talking about people who are engaged in all of the isms of the world, but within the realm of Christendom. He is talking with those who say, I'm a born-again one. And to drive home the seriousness of his lesson, he doesn't illustrate with some ho-hum profession, but one that is most spectacular. People who preached in Christ's name, who cast out demons in his name, who did miraculous works in his name. I mean, what better profession could you get than that? And yet Christ wants to make it perfectly clear that in spite of their false profession, that with courteous orthodoxy, they say, Lord, Lord. And in spite of their false preaching, where they prophesy in his name and in spite of their false miracles, where they perform many miracles in his name. And by the way, there is no reason to doubt the truth of their claim because Jesus said false teachers and false Christ will do miracles in his name. But these are people who are talk without truth. Truth, they are profession without reality. And they say this to him, Lord, Lord, and he will go on and say to them, I never knew you. Not I once knew you. But I never ever knew you. Depart from me. You who practice lawlessness. They use his name freely. But in a saving way. Their name is unknown to him because it is not in the Lamb's book of life. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. I may make you mad, but I'd rather get you mad now and get right with God than before it is forever too Light. Now, our Father, I thank you this morning for your magnificent grace. We recognize that we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That there are not just big sinners and small sinners. That all of us are unrighteous before you. All of us equally in need of a Savior. All of us equally in need of forgiveness. And I thank you that Jesus said all manner of sin will be forgiven by the Son of Man. Divorce, murder, whatever it may be. Adultery, fornication, abortion. You said it all is forgiven. For those who come and embrace Christ as Lord. You said my sheep hear my voice. And I know them and they follow me and I give eternal life to them and they shall never perish. That no one shall snatch them out of my hand that my father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one shall take them out of my father's hand because we're both God. We're one. I pray, though, Father, for someone who may have a false assurance. Who does not hear in a way that results in heeding the son of God. Those who want Christ as Savior, but are not willing to yield to him as Lord. May you open up the eyes of their heart today. To change their mind about sin. To have genuine repentance. That when they say, Lord, Lord. It comes out of a regenerate, born again heart. Friend, if you're here today and you've never submitted to Christ as Lord. May I remind you that Jesus said, unless you repent, you will perish. May I remind you that Jesus said that there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who sees his need to repent than over 99 sinners who see no such need. You cannot come to Christ holding your sin. You must come to him and yield your life to him. Have you ever done that? Would you, in simple childlike faith today, cry out to him and say, Lord Jesus, save even me. I thank you, Father, for your patience with us. 
We recognize that your word teaches that lordship is progressive and lifelong as it relates to the child of God. And if there are areas of compromise in our lives and reveal it to us by the spirit of God and by your word, that we might live in purity before the one who loved us and gave himself for us. And we ask it all in Jesus name and for his sake. Amen.